thank you so much everyone for joining in today it's another a great session that we have today and i think we will uh, be hearing about quite an important issue uh, but it's less talked about i think in the amr space and it's good you also uh, hear about it and you know how gender really influences and correlates with amr and today we have a great speaker with us dr rosemary morgan i'm sorry dr rosemary i realized my internet started hanging uh, so i'm not able to share my video but that's me in that picture so i hope it's okay so i'll start by introducing uh, dr rosemary uh, she's an associate scientist at john hopkins bloomberg a school of public health uh, in the department of international health and uh, she has expertise in gender gender analysis and intersectionality in health and health systems her current work includes leading in the sex and gender analysis core for the sex and age differences in immunity to influenza center and she's the co-principal investigator on the monitoring and action for gender and equity the image project and gender equality and social inclusion advisor for learning acting and building for rehabilitation in health systems so it's a great pleasure having a great uh, expert speaking to us today and i like to uh, welcome you so much uh, dr rosemary thank you uh, so much for making time uh, to join us today and uh, over to you thank you okay thank you so much daniel and it's a really pleasure to be here today um, I just wanted to put my video on for a moment so you could all see me, but I know connectivity issues uh, can could be a challenge. So I am going to turn the video off just to to help to help with bandwidth. But I will be sharing my screen, so that should help. Yeah, so I, uh, as Daniel said, I am an associate scientist at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and I do a lot of work related to gender and gender analysis and, and health. And I was delighted to receive an invitation from you all to come and speak to you today about this topic and kind of bring this lens specifically to AMR. Um, I would like this session to be a little bit participatory today. So, you know, if you have questions in the, you know, as we go along, please put them in the chat. Or if you, um, I'll have some questions for you as well that that you can that you can answer, and you can do that in the chat or by raising raising your hand. That would be great. So let's move on. So I wanted to start us off with a under with a definition of gender. So we make sure we're all on the same page about how gender is defined and how I'm coming at it. So I've included here on the screen the definition of gender from the World Health Organization. And so the World Health Organization defines gender as the characteristics of women, men, girls, and boys, and I have added, and gender minority individuals that are socially constructed. This includes norms, behaviors, and roles associated with being a woman, man, girl, or boy, as well as relationships with each other. So the key takeaway points here are that gender is socially constructed um, and you know, really is, is also relation, re relational and involves norms, behaviors, roles. We're gonna be going into a bit more detail. Um, I wanted to unpack a little bit more about what I mean by gender. Um, so here you can see in this pyramid, uh, that we can see where and where the different dimensions gender influences, and it really does influence everything uh, in our lives. So if you look at the bottom of the pyramid, gender or gender power relations influence how society is organized more broadly in terms of our social norms, our institutions, our structures, resources within all social systems. So if you're thinking about the social ecological model, we've got families and households, communities, economies, states. In the middle there of the pyramid, you can see that it also encompasses, encompasses our interpersonal relationships between individuals, how we relate to one another, how we relate to our family and our partners. Oh, just, okay. And at the top of the pyramid here, 
it influences uh, our individual identities and values. So what, a distinction I would like to make is between gender identity and gender power relations. So, so gender power relations absolutely inform and influence our gender identities. And our gender identity is how we personally uh, identify. Do we identify as being a man or a woman or a gender minority individual? And that how a gender identity can be different from a person's biological sex. So the sex that they were assigned at, at birth. Some other key important components when we're thinking about gender is that it is negotiated by society, individuals and societies, and as a result, changes over time and across context. So what it mean, meant to be a man or woman 50 years ago can be very different what it, from what it means now. What it means to be a man or a woman in one country can be, is very, can be very different than in another country. So it is something that is negotiated and changing. Another important point is that it interacts with other social stratifiers such as class, race, education, ethnicity, age, geographic location, disability, and sexuality. So this is the notion of intersectionality that many of you are probably familiar with. So thinking about how, how different social identities intersect to influence our individual experiences of marginalization, of privilege, of disadvantage, and advantage. And it's the think also thinking through that that not all women are going to have the same experiences and not all men are going to have the same experiences because of this intersection of other social stratifiers. And as I've mentioned, gender is different from biological sex, but very much interrelated. So when we are taking a gender lens, we are thinking about uh, biological sex and, and how, and, you know, what that means for women and men's health and how it interrelates with gender. This list is by no means exhaustive, uh, but I wanted to just touch briefly on, you know, on the different things that we know and evidence shows that gender as a social inequity effects in relation to health. So it can affect our vulnerability to illness, you know, our exposure to illness. So that can maybe be through our occupations, you know, who we come in contact with. It can affect our health status, meaning, you know, by, by virtue of, are we able to, to access health care, preventative care? Are we discriminated against when we access that care? Are we able to, to get the, the care that we need? So our access to preventative and curative measures, the overall burden of ill health, for example, we know life expectancy for men, it tends to be lower for women than, than women, but women overall have a larger proportion of, of ill health or disability. It also affects our quality of care, the type of care that we receive. And do please keep in mind the intersectional component here, you know, how gender might in intersect with whether we know not we have a disability, our race or, or ethnicity and our age and how that impacts these things. It can impact the roles and responsibilities in relation to the care we receive and then also the treatment received. So this is, again, like I said, this list is by no means exhaustive, but just wanted to show that there are different ways that gender, uh, gender power relations affect health. I wanted to go through just two brief examples here to, to really highlight this before we get into the discussion of AMR specifically. So this graph uh, is looks, it's from UNAIDS, uh, it's from 2000, 2013 report on new HIV infections in Sub-Saharan Africa. I like this graph because it provides intersectional data. It looks, it allows us to see both age and sex. Uh, and if you look at this graph, what's, what's interesting is, you know, the blue are males and the green are females. Um, and what we can see here, for example, is that ages 25 to 49, for example, have the highest burden of new HIV infections, right? But ages 15 to 24, we see the largest inequity. So we see the largest gap or difference between males and females. 
So a lot more females are getting newly infected with HIV than males. I would like to just stop for a moment just to ask all of you why you think this might be the case. What might be driving the, this difference uh, between males and females in the 15 to 24 range? So feel free to put in the chat your, your thoughts on that. Does anyone have any ideas? Is that if you want to raise your virtual hand, please do. Uh, I thank you. I see. Um, sorry, I might my pronunciations of names is not going to be <laughs> not going to be great, and I apologize if I mispronounce your name. Uh, but Zacharia um, says women enter puberty earlier. Um, how might that Zacharia if drive um, drive this? If you can elaborate on that, that would be great. Hello, Dr. Rosemary. I can see Zachary has raised uh, his hand. Maybe yes. can unmute. Yeah, Zachary, if you can unmute, please go ahead. Okay, um, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, my own um, suggestion is that um, women kind of, um, they tend to get puberty earlier than men. And for, for you to get to puberty, you get to have um, more um, urges to have sex. And we know um, the major um, form of contagion of um, HIV AIDS is to sexual intercourse. And since men have, um, let's say, uh, they get puberty around, let's say, um, 18, 20, 20, 21, like that. So um, they tend to have sex around that age, which makes um, men um, kind of lower the age of 15 to 24. And because women get to their poverty level and the urge for sex and their likes is more um, higher between that range, they get to have um, um, HIV, maybe because of um, unprotected sex or their likes. These are my thoughts. Thank you very much. Great. Yes. Thank you for, for those. Uh, yeah. What I heard is, um, you know, women entering puberty earlier. Uh, I heard you talk about differences of, of when people have sex for the first time, potentially what is acceptable for girls and boys to have sex for the first time. Um, and I, those all to me related to, to gender norms. Um, I see that Jennifer has put in the chat at autonomy and nature of genitalia. Yep, I think biological sex is it, you know, thinking how that intersects. Sorry, did you wanna come in? Oh, I thought someone went off mute. Um, so yeah, that's important considerations. Uh, with Tuba um, says that 15 to 24 year olds are generally in their school years, often involved in relationships with much older men. Yep, um, that is something that we do see in some contexts. And additionally, early child marriage is still a huge issue. And these very much to me are, are gender issues. Uh, sex education, not focusing on sexuality, Michelle says, um, and em Emanuela says women also use sex as a source of income, so there are more risks associated with it. And I see um, Idris has their hand up. Idris, do you want to please to go ahead and share your thoughts? Oh, yes, thank you, Rosemary. So am I audible? Yes. So basically, I think in recent years, there have been more like sexual freedom or liberation amongst the female compared to how it was in like in the past. Like it's it's it, it, it's looking less like less more acceptable for females to have sex like outside relationships than it were like in the olden days. So that has resulted in more sex amongst females and more being at risk to HIV and all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, potentially if you're thinking about sort of rate of yes yeah, sexual debut and and sex the you know what is what's when it is acceptable for girls to have have sexual relations i think bringing that in with some of these other points that uh, uh, people in the chat have mentioned like women using sex as a source of income and there are gender reasons behind that why women might, might more women do that 
Um, the, the idea of sex education not being part of, uh, not focusing female sexuality and the, the relationships between younger girls and older men, I think is, is an important one and how, how that relates to access to financial resources. Um, I don't see, yeah, I see Kaumba says contributing factors may, may lead to the increased rate of HIV, could be socioeconomic status, poverty stricken individuals may result, yes, to sexual work as a source of income and bringing in another dynamic there, which is great, looking at the intersection of poverty uh, and age and gender. Um, and I haven't seen anybody mention autonomy and, you know, thinking about decision making. So when girls and women do enter these sexual relationships, are they able to negotiate safe sex practices, for example, to use a condom? I see Michelle mentioned that men not going to hospital to test. That is an important gender consideration because if people aren't getting tested, they don't if they, and they don't know they're HIV positive, and they are having unprotected sexual interactions, they may be spreading that out. So these are all really, you know, potential reasons or gender reasons and intersectional reasons that might be driving this. And this analysis to me is really important because, you know, from a public health perspective. If we wanted our, or if we wanted to target our interventions at the group where that was most impacted in terms of numbers, we might target the age 65 to 49. And I'm sure, absolutely positive, there are differences in what's driving HIV infections among men and women in this group. Uh, however, we do see a similar, similar nut range. Whereas if, if our public health intervention, we wanted to, draw, to think about equity and reducing inequities and addressing this gap, we would want to target the 15 to 24 range. And we really need to understand what's driving this um, and uh, what's driving this, this gap to be able to develop interventions that address it. And a gender analysis can really help us do that. Here's another example. So this one looks at TB uh, in Kenya in 2015 from the World Health Organization. Um, and you can see this is also look, bringing in that intersectional lens, looking at gender and um, or sex and age here. So, and as you can see, the blue are females and the green are males. And in and, and the age groups that we see, uh, age 25 to 34 and 35 to 44, we see a lot more men than women having notified cases by age um, than, than women in those groups. Can, does anyone want to suggest, oh, sorry, does anyone want to suggest why we might see these differences between men and women here? And this is related to TB, tuberculosis. So please do, uh, oh, yes, me, go ahead. Men smoke, I think, mm. and they are, yeah, that's why they are, they are many. And how is smoking related to TB? Uh, I, I, I think actually smoking may be predisposed uh, lungs, yeah, mm. yeah, to, to, to getting infected, yeah. Yeah. I think that the you know thinking about those risk factors really important um, there and how different activities that we might engage in um, are might be risk factors. Michael, please go ahead. I think. Michael, it's a little hard to hear you, unfortunately. <laughs> Michael, do you think you could Very put much? I, I hope I'm audible enough. Um, yeah, Michael, unfortunately, we're not able to hear you. So, Michael, would you be able to um, put your contribution in the chat and then we can read it out? Unfortunately, we weren't able to hear you. Zacharia, if I can hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, in my opinion, I feel um, the aim here is to identify people 
and it's like the working age in age range for um, most um, men and women. So I feel it has to do with um, 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 work. So um, men have to work in places that are more crowded and places that have to do with more uh, body contact and um, and you know TB has to do with um, transferring. It's an aerosol you transfer it through the air. So um, maybe the the have um, they are predisposed to um, people that have TB and maybe you cough in the workplace and one get something like that. And in Africa, women are known to kind of work in places that are more like less kinds like less populous, like at home or mm -hmm. um, places that are not kind of um, crowded. But men are known for the crowded places, like let's see uh, in the military, in the place of work, in the football, and and stuff like that. So I think this crowd is having um is having issues, is having relationship to um the transfer of TV at this stage. So let's try to get it for. I think these are my thoughts. It is mm -hmm. with the work, occupational stuff like that, and the play they do, and the exposure to things that they do, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And I see in the chat too, Daniel was mentioning something similar around gendered occupational differences, uh, which I think is very much uh, a driving force. We see uh, exposure to TB, you know, who, who is working outside the home, who's allowed to work outside the home, what types of jobs are they doing? Uh, are they, ex you know, exposed to more crowded areas? Um, and then what types of men as well to think through uh, might be the ones exposed to those jobs that that are more crowded that might have you know where, where TB can can be spread more easily. Um, I think you know thinking through that in relation to the previous comment and risk taking behaviors um, that might predispose males to TB I think someone else had mentioned uh, about when we were talking about HIV going to get tested and that's like also with TB who's going to get tested and who's not is our important considerations. Um, I see that Emanuela mentioned as well as about work environments where, which involve a lot of smoke. Michael, thank you for sharing your thoughts in the chat. Um, the ratio of men to women who suffer from TV in Uganda is three to one. Men, due to their line of work and lifestyle, have higher chances of being exposed to risk factors of TB, like drinking alcohol, working in crowded spaces, and poor health-seeking habits have led to high incidence of TB compared to men. Yep. And body autonomy and exposure, those are important considerations. So great. Um, so this, again, shows, I think, really well why it's important to take this gender lens to understand what, may, what might be driving these forces or these, these numbers so we can, we can intervene if needed. So to do that, we, need, we, do, we take a gender analysis. Uh, we do gender analysis. And gender analysis is the process of analyzing how gender power relations affect people's lives, create differences in needs and experiences, and then what we can do about that. We kind of just did that in the last two, two examples. We thought about how gender might be driving those differences that we saw. And then our next step might be, what, how might we intervene? There are some frameworks that can help us to do this, which I think might be useful in your, your work as you, as you move forward in your careers. Uh, this is an amalgamation of two frameworks that helps us think through the types of programs that we might want to create. So when you're thinking about your AMR programs, for example, um, mapping it onto to these continuums can be helpful. So we've got gender equality continuum, which is gender exploitative, gender accommodative, and gender transformative interventions. And then also that the the continuum at the top is from the World Health Organization and it's their gender assessment. Um, so what, what bringing in a gender lens helps us to ensure we're having gender sensitive, specific or transformative interventions um, or a com gender transform accommodative or transformative interventions and programs so that we're acknowledging, we're, we're understanding how gender inequities might be driving these differences modifying our programs accordingly or designing them accordingly. And then gender transformative interventions was we're actually looking to seek to challenge and change harmful gender norms, roles, and relations that might be causing these inequities in the first place. 
A framework that I liked that I use a lot when I conduct gender analysis, and we'll kind of go through this a little bit uh, with AMR. And this is in a paper that we published, how to do gender analysis and health systems research. Really what this does is it breaks down the ways in which gender power relations manifest as inequities. And then our job next would be to say, well, what does this mean for health? What does this mean for health prevention? What does this mean for the topic that I'm interested in? So as you, you can see at the top there, you know, thinking about what constitutes gender power relations, we, we can ask the questions, who has what, who does what, how are values defined, and who decides. So who does has what, that's related to access to resources. So thinking about an ec potential and equitable access to resources between and among men and women. And there's different types of resources, as you can see, education, information, skills, income, employment, benefits, etc. Who does what? That relates to roles and practices. So division of labor within and beyond the house. Uh, what type of jobs do people do, uh, for example? Who does the, who works outside the home, whose responsibility it is to look after children? How are values defined? That's related to norms and beliefs. And of course, gender norms very much uh, interrelate with these other factors. So gender norms around what's acceptable for men and women is going to influence who does what and then who has what as well. And then who decides? So these are thinking about decision-making and autonomy, different rules that, that govern our lives. And at the bottom of the framework here, you can see, you know, thinking about where we can negotiate and change this power at the individual people level or structural environmental level. And that's helpful when thinking about interventions. So I want to take us through a um, so AMR now to apply this lens to, to AMR, particularly from the health, from the health perspective. So less from, I saw we had a lot of people in the in the group today doing veterinary sciences. We're not coming at it from that lens today, but we absolutely could do that. Um, so we, we are coming at it more in terms of the person and, and health lens. So thinking through, for example, you know, how might, in so gender power relations or gender norms, roles, relations, gender inequities, different ways to say the same thing, how might it infect, affect risk of infection, access to healthcare and antibiotics, quality of care received, misuse or overuse or underuse of antibiotics. So we can apply a gender lens to each of these areas to try to think about how might gender and gender inequities impact these different areas and what that means for, for AMR or preventing AMR, and then what can we do or should do about it. A tool that you can use to do this is the gender analysis matrix. Um, and you can see here the gender domains that were on the framework that we looked at. So looking at access to resources, distribution of labor, norms and values, decision-making power, and then I've included those uh, AMR domains or different areas related to the previous slide. So it's not exhaustive, but I've included some of the areas that we know from the evidence that, that uh, are important for AMR related to risk of infection, access to healthcare, treatment, and use of antibiotics. Um, in the matrix, you'll see there's also columns for including sex desegregated data. So here, this might be data around, again, number of women and men with TB, you know, number of women and men with access to drugs for TB. So thinking about where, you know, gaps or the not, you, prevalence incidents might lie in here, we might see where there's are, are inequities, but not necessarily know why. So I might put that, that data around TB that men have more TB here, but I don't really know why. And then the gender domains can help interrogate and find out why. And then the intersectional considerations is important to ensure we're, we are not treating all men and women the same. And we're, we're thinking about how they have, that different identities can lead to different experiences. So let's go through each of these. So we've kind of done this one already with gender and just, just looking at the time, I'm making sure we have enough time um, we've done, done looked at the risk of infection a little bit already, 
Um, but thinking about infection in terms of any of the types of infection that might lead to use of antibiotics, what are some gender differences in risk of infection between men and women? Can you think of any? You can use any any type of infection as an example, but you know, relate potentially the ones the ones that are related to use of antibiotics. We can use the chat box or raise your hand if you have any examples. Idris, please. Hello, can you hear me, please? Yes. And um, good evening, ma'am. And um, in time of raising risk, risk of infection, I want to cite UCI as an example. As you generally start infection, women tend to have infection in time of urinary tract infection more than men because of the anatomical makeup of their uh, genital system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. And I see that so, uh, you'd see in the I chat is agreeing. Mm -hmm. Like taking more antibiotics than men. Well, sometimes if not, maybe men went extra mile, maybe doing a, you know, involving in an unprotected sex. So men really have urinary tract infection. But women, sometimes even on usage of toilet, that an um, um, it may be dirty, not clean. This expose them, expose them to having such type of infection. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great example. Thank you. So that also is an example looking at the intersection of biology, so biological sex and gender, right? From a biological standpoint, women are more prone to urinary tract infections. And Zacharia says differences in normal flora of different sites that could be opportunistic. Zachary, I think I'm going to need you to explain that one because you know more about that than me. So please. Okay. Please go ahead. I think it's it's almost um with what it is said earlier. It has to do with um some side like um male genitalia, female genitalia, let's say. Female are we'll be having um different amount of flora in the genitalia to kind of maintain the pH, the alkalinity, and the kind of uh, the texture of their genitalia. And male doesn't have those kind of structures, which will make them have um, different amount of flora to female. And in regards to AMR, um it will kind of make them opportunities like that if you use drugs and the, those are normal flora tends to become opportunistic, they become resistant and more damages tend to occur after then. I think that's what I want to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. And Daniel says power differences in negotiating for safe sex may predispose women to more sexually transmitted infections, i.e., gonorrhea in contexts where men have multiple partners. Yeah, that's a good, that's a great example. Um, women are more exposed to infection due to immune system. Women tend to have a lower immune system fighting agent than men. Uh, I, I just says, yeah, I think women have more robust immune systems, which is why we often see autoimmune diseases higher among women. And so what does that mean for infections is important to think about. So here are some examples, and some of you have brought these up, some of these already. So, and again, this is no means exhaustive, just some examples to highlight. So we had a few people mention urinary tract infections more common in women. I think that that's an important one, made, made them inter, make, made the, make them interact with the health system more, have access to antibiotics more. Uh, childbirth, abortion, sanitary health care could might expose women to a large range of, of different types of infections. Infection. We see women tend to engage with the health facility more because of some of these, um, these aspects. Uh, Daniel mentioned sexually transmitted infections and ability to practice safe sexual practices is, is important in thinking about power and autonomy there. 
Um, and then also no one mentioned, you know, certain professions and there are some female dominated professions such as teaching and healthcare that are associated with more frequent exposure to infection and disease. So it is important to think about exposure here when we're thinking about infections and how that might drive increased exposure in certain groups over others. All right, access to healthcare and antibiotics. Um, if if so anyone want to put in the chat or raise their hand, we'll take one or two examples so as I want to make sure we can get through everything. Uh, how might gender affect access to healthcare and and or access to antibiotics? Zachary, up, please. Africa, so I mean, I'll be asking in the African context here, yeah? or let's say from the Nigerian context. Um, in Nigeria, guys, but especially in the north, women tend to ask for permission from their husband before doing most things outside the house. So women tend to ask for permission from the man before they want access, and um, they don't have access to healthcare. So it's on it's on the approval of the man before woman um goes to um take those drugs or goes to a pharmacy or or see a doctor or the likes like that. So I feel um, these are part of things that um, reduce access of women to uh, to healthcare in, uh, in in the northern part of Nigeria, let's say like that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Mohammed, did you want to come in? I saw you had your hand up. Sorry, I, I wanted to say the same thing. Zachary, I've said most of it. So um, I'll just add that um, most of um, women get their finances from the men. So even if they, they go to the hospital and then they are prescribed antibiotics, they need to um, discuss with their husbands and get some funds to buy antibiotics. That's just what I'll add. Great. Yeah, thank you for that. And is it Nabis 3? Please go ahead. Thank you. Can I be high? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you so much. So for me, I think that women are more willing to be vulnerable in society and say maybe I have this illness. So they're more willing to go to a healthcare facility to get the services they need, or maybe to get antibiotics or any other treatment. While men are, are seen more to be, um, they have to be the man, so they, they may tend to hide any illness that they have. And so it may take them longer to go out there and say, I have an illness, so they may not access antibiotics or any healthcare services timely. Yep. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Great. That's a great example. Thank you. And I think Daniel in the chat also is examples along those lines as well. Um, poor health seeking behavior among men, especially due to cultural norms. Uh, I see George says financial imbalances, especially in a context where the woman is not working and cannot afford to cater for their own health or are dependent on their husbands. Yes. And uh, Titsu says women have more access to health to because they are very careful beings and are very conscious, men tend to seek healthcare as a last resort. Um, I think in some cases, yes, not to, might be a bit of a generalization to see about being to careful beings and health conscious, but I do agree overall about um, you know, women be engaging with the health center, health, health sector more. Uh, I think that goes to what you're saying goes to the point that we just heard around. Um, men not potentially being as vulnerable and not seeking health care. And Damiola says shame and embarrassment can contribute to access to an antibiotic. Damiola, do you want to um, elaborate on that one if you feel comfortable? I think that's an interesting example. Hi. Um, so I'm on transit, but I just hope you can hear me. Yep. Yep. Okay, so um, 
basically, uh, human embarrassment in the sense that most women, when they have uh, diseases that um, pertaining to unitary uni uh, tract infections or you know sexually transmitted diseases, there are there is already this um, skepticism about it. They don't want to discuss these issues with their healthcare practitioners. They don't even want to, you know, let people know that they have this issue because of the way our mindset has been conditioned about certain things. So they don't want to go to the hospital and say, oh, I have this problem. Mm -hmm. I have a change, I have a... Um, I have problems with so I think it's harassment and you know, I think that's uh, that's the point I was talking about. Thank you. Great, thank you. And I think uh, George's comment in the chat is alongside that as well about societal norms that shame women for certain illnesses such as sexually transmitted infections. Um, may may like I think go along with uh, what D Damiola was saying. Great, so those are all really great examples. And here are again, some, um, some examples here, many of which you've already talked about, how, thinking about how gender norms, roles, uh, relations can affect our healthcare seeking behavior when we are sick. Um, people mentioned access to financial resources to obtain care or purchase antibiotics. Deci someone mentioned decision-making power autonomy to utilize those resources. And then also, we do see some evidence around gender norms and attitudes influencing the prescribing practices of healthcare providers towards male and female patients. And that in some contexts, women are more likely to be prescribed antibiotics. In other cases, men are more likely, uh, which, is, which is interesting. I'm going to just go through the next couple slides because I want to make sure we have enough time for, for questions. Um, so I've got the, the, uh, the, the last two categories are use of antibiotics. Uh, and here are some examples, again, if you can probably think of others, of how gender might affect someone's actual use of antibiotics. So, so let's say that first, you know, thinking through whether or not they, that they've had to have a risk of infection, exposure to infection, were they able to access healthcare, were they able to access an antibiotic, now that they have the antibiotic, what, what, how might gender affect that? So we see uh, examples of the amounts of medication consumed. Are some people more likely to overuse antibiotics or being overprescribed and that so therefore overuse antibiotics? Rates of noncompliance. Uh, we do see some examples of men or women or certain groups of people completing their, their, um, their prescription. You know, and what that means when they don't complete complete that, we see that with TB a lot. For example, it's a long process uh, with with tuberculosis, and we see different rates of compliance. Um, whether people have inclination to adopt self medication. So, in some cases, if people aren't access, able to access healthcare, they might go and access antibiotics under the table or from uh, from pharmacies and self medicate. And they may, may or may not be medicating appropriately in that sense. Different varied educational levels and knowledge about antibiotic use, when it should be used, how it should be used. And we've already mentioned sort of the likelihood of being prescribed antibiotics in the first place. So those are just a, a few examples. I didn't go to go over the sort of treatment one, which I think is also important, but the treatment one is how are we actually treated when we, when we interact with the health system? Are we treated with respect? Is it confident? Do we have confidentiality and privacy? Are we being discriminated against? That might link to people's likelihood of going to seek care in the first place. So all of this is interrelated. You can kind of see it on this continuum. We need to have this big picture along this continuum to understand how gender roles, norms, and relations might affect people's, you know, care-seeking journey from getting sick to interacting with the health system to using antibiotics. Um, and here, I just wanted to come back to the gender analysis matrix. This is not complete. I just put in some examples here, but this is something you could do in your own work. You know, take look at the different domains of interest for AMR. Here we're looking at risk of infection, access to healthcare and antibiotics, use of antibiotics. Here, what we're doing is like sort of putting in 
how gender may affect these areas. Of course, I would want this to be evidence-based. I would want to have evidence to support some of these, the, these notions. So I might start with this brainstorming exercise and then my next matrix might only include that the um, aspects that I have evidence for. And then that would allow me to say, okay, how, what do I need to do about this? Uh, what interventions do I need? How can I modify my interventions to ensure that they are being gender responsive so I can be more effective? Um, and just very briefly, you know, thinking about integrating gender into our AMR interventions, different ways that we can do it and what it allows us to do uh, by doing this type of analysis, you know, we could thinking through a gender analysis of our surveillance data, ensuring we're desegregating data by sex and other stratifiers, we're integrating that gender lens and different gender indicators, you know, things so we can understand what's really going on. This allows us to create gender responsive infection prevention and control and training, making sure we have more tailored interventions and programs to prevent AMR. We know people's risks are different. Um, it's different among and between men and women. People's engagement with the health system is different. We need to take into account of that if we want to have more effective programs. So with that, I will stop sharing. And I think we've got 10 minutes for, for Q&A. So please, if you have also, if, not just questions, if you have reflections, uh, examples, please do share, raise your virtual hand or, or put, put it in the chat. Are you still there? I can't tell. Hello, I think Dr. Rosemary Zachary has asked one in the chat. Okay. Feel, yeah, great, thank you. I see that, do you feel sex and gender are the same or sort of have some similarities? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Sex and gender are not the same, but they are interrelated. So biological sex has to do with uh, biology, our genitalia or chromosomes. Right. And actually, there is a lot of research that shows complexity of biological sex um, and how it's not necessarily sort of a continuum or it is a continuum. It's not binary like we might might think. Um, so but it is different, but very much related. So a lot of a lot of the care we need is due to our biological sex, whereas gender, on the other hand, are, is socially constructed. You know, it's uh, and it changes over time. And again, they are different, but very much interrelated. Muhammad, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. So my question is, are there researches that have been done to accommodate other sex groups like, um, like gay, lesbians? transgender and the rest? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question as well. Um, and that is bringing in that intersectionality lens, which is so important. Um, so gender is different than sexual orientation, but it is, again, very much related, like sex and gender are related. Uh, and, you know, a person's gender identity is different from their sexual orientation. Uh, the, for when we're thinking of um, LGBTQ+, you know, when we're bringing in the gender lens, transgender men and transgender women, that's really, you know, thinking about gender is when someone's biological sex does not match the gender identity that they identify with. There is work in this area. It, there is, it's not as much, I would say, and it's also because these groups tend to be highly stigmatized and marginalized. Uh, but they they do tend to, you know, you could bring this gender lens into that that group and say, how does that impact people's exposure to infection? How does that impact the care? So if I'm a transgender individual or a gay individual, 
and I'm accessing want to access health care, but I am discriminated against when I do, it'll likely prevent me from coming back again. So the next time I get sick, I might let it go or go and try to obtain antibiotics on my own, which could add to anti um, AMR. Um, so it's there is work in these areas. I would say it's not as much because these tend to be highly stigmatized groups. And in settings when the, where these groups are highly stigmatized, we have to be careful to uh, to protect them um, when when we do this work to not put them in harm's way. I I dress, please. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not sure about something you mentioned that when the case of transgender, when a person's gender does not align with the assigned sex at birth. Yeah. So for this, like what, what, what I'm not sure about is like biological assigned sex at birth is supposed to be like a biological thing, not like no a feeling or something like that. So if somebody could change like his sex, his biologically assigned sex because of like perhaps perhaps a social constructs. It kind of leads to like a like a mixed up in the like in the healthcare system because healthcare is being studied like biologically. So like perhaps this sex, this person's like genetic makeup and his whole like biological sex. This is how the person which is like the body and all the all those things. So if you like alter it because of like a social construct, then is that not like is it not so defeating like for the whole healthcare spending in the first instance? I, I'm not sure if I got all of that, I, I address, I, but the hope, so let's see if, if I answer this. Let me know if, I, if I'm not answering it correctly. Um, it's that transgender individuals require, you know, very specialized care. And let's say a transgender man is, is someone who is biologically born female and might therefore need services that assist gender women. So a cisgender woman is a woman whose biological sex and gender identity align. Um, so, but then if they're presenting to the health center and they look like a man, but they have a, a vagina, for example, or a cervix, they're still gonna need very like care they know they're still going to be susceptible for year to urinary tract infections, right? They're still going to be, you know, um, for cervical cancer. So they need this sort of special care. And, and it's important, you know, when we're designing and developing health services to think about the, these issues that we're providing these care in a non-discriminatory way, in an inclusive way, and in, in a way that we're affirming uh, people's, people's gender identity. I know in some contexts, these, these groups are highly, highly stigmatized, so they may not be coming out. In the U.S., this is a a more a big consideration because we you know we do have populations and and we do need care to, to to cater to these groups. Hopefully that that answered your question. I wasn't sure I heard everything correctly. Um, Iridat, please go ahead. Okay, good afternoon. Thank you for the experience and the knowledge you shared. Um, concerning the gender um, discrimination or um, access to healthcare, when you talk about HIV, which is being, which is mostly affected by women, and TB, which is mostly affected by, um, uh, by male. So when it comes to AMR, how do we know which part, uh, which uh, gender is most affected or the most vulnerable in the society? We also have children which also use antibiotics. So how do you know which gender is most affected when it comes to AMR? Yeah. And so a gender analysis can help you understand how different groups are, are affected differently. And I don't, I don't think it's a matter of who is most, who is most affected. Can you hear me okay, Daniel? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so it's not to me a matter of who's most infected, but how are people differentially affected? So if men and women's risk factors are different, we need to understand that to design interventions accordingly. There may be groups that are more affected, like with TB, right? We know men tend to be more exposed to TB and have TB, so we might tailor interventions correctly, appropriately 
There'll be certain in infections that women are more uh, exposed to. Uh, and then there might be different reasons of, of gender re issues related to how people utilize antibiotics or access them that we need to understand. And this gender uh, analysis will help us do this. Jennifer, this kind of goes to your question too about how is surveillance done to know the gender factors that affect health. Um, how it's done right now, overall, um, I couldn't really say. I don't. I don't know. Um, I know some people who've worked, done this work in gender, and health, um, or gender and AMR. Whether I really think in, including gender analysis into AMR surveillance would be really important to do, and hopefully we, you know, how we could do that. Some of the things we talked about today. Um, I just wanted to look at well in the last minute, the last couple questions that are in the chat. So George says, I would like to inquire whether we can include other factors more noticeable in the African context among the gender issues, such as polygamy, larger age differences between spouse, the poor involvement participation in, in men uh, and matters related, men's matters health and HPV. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. When you do a gender analysis, you need to make sure it's appropriate to the context that you're doing and, and you want to bring in. So if I was doing that, that uh, gender matrix, these would be exactly the types of things I would bring in if they were relevant for my context. So absolutely, I would I would do that. And I see I just says tackling AMR from point, will it not look like in a community in which the intervention had? Oh, I see. Tucking AMR from a gender point of view, will it not look like putting pressure on a specific gender in a community in which the intervention will be carried out? Um, yeah, I think that's an important consideration. I think you can um, you can bring a gender lens to your study without potentially targeting one specific group. Like you could target, you could do it in. Well, I mean, you. I think one, it's okay to have an intervention that targets a specific group if that specific group is found to be highly vulnerable. It's okay to do that. We gotta make sure we're doing it in a way that's non-stigmatizing. You can also bring in a gender lens to an intervention that's targeting men and women, but you're tailoring your messages differently, right? Based on what their, um, what risk factors they might have, for example. Um, so I think with with a gender bringing a gender lens in, you can do it in, in different ways, and you you just need to justify. I mean, if you're doing a intervention around urinary tract infections, it would make sense to focus on women, right? Um, in, in that sense, um, because women are are most most impacted by that. Um, if I'm doing an intervention on uh, overuse of antibiotics. I would want to target both men and women, but I'd want to understand the reasons behind overuse and then tailor my messaging. So I think we are at time. So Daniel, if I can hand it back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rosemary, for that really uh, informative uh, webinar and also the interactive session that you've had, you know, also getting to Share. Uh, thanks so much. We appreciate uh, that you made it today and uh, shared with us your insights and also triggered us to think of what we know to. And I think um, it's a good session. I think it's good we also, uh, you know, start looking uh, at, an, at at AMR from that viewpoint because I think uh, there's still to that has been done in that area and it's something, and I believe that we can all start small maybe even looking at our small interventions and as Dr. Rosemary has said, trying to tailor them uh, as per you know, the gender you're addressing or the context. Uh, so with that, I think uh, we've come to the end of the session. I think we are two minutes past, but I thank you all for attending today. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rosemary, for attending to and uh, taking us through. We really appreciate you for your time and efforts. And thank you everyone who attended and who uh, participated. And hopefully we can have you maybe some time back, uh, Dr. Rosemary. I see the conversation was still uh, very ripe and uh, very fresh. Yeah. So over to you maybe for some final remarks, Dr. Rosemary, then I think we can close it here. Sure. Um, great. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me here today. 
And as um, as Daniel mentioned, I think we can all you can also we can always start small, you know, bringing in that that gender lens, and sometimes it's just by asking a question. You know, we in we can definitely integrate gender into our our programming and to our research, and it is really important to do so because it does ensure that our interventions and work is more effective, but that we're also addressing the underlying causes. I mean, always gender transformative interventions are what we want to strive for. We want to challenge and change harmful gender norms, rules, and relations, but that's not always possible. So at that sometimes just no understanding the gendered context and what that means for women and women differently, as well as gender minority individuals and ensuring that our health systems and our programs and interventions are appropriate for that context, I think is a really, really great first step. So thank you so much for having me here today. Um, and yeah, there's, uh, I've shared the slides with Daniel and the links that are on the slides will take you to the various resources if you're interested in, in more, uh, to hear more. So thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Rosemary. Thank you so much everyone for attending. It has really been a wonderful, informative and very engaging session and do have a wonderful uh, evening, Dr. Rosemary, do have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.